things. Um, we've got some um, uh, some great speakers for you. Um, so hopefully you'll uh, you'll take something from this uh, this session. So. Um, I'll kick off with just a kind of a brief introduction to Abley. This isn't a kind of a full on sales pitch, so I don't feel as though uh, you're going to be bombarded with this stuff. Um, but for those people who don't really know Abley, it's worth just going back and having a look at um, where we where we came from. So um, you may remember in the dim and distant past, there was a, a company called Interpret Geospatial Solutions. Well, Interpret Geospatial Solutions was a brand of another company called Abley Transportation Consultants. Uh, and it was just basically two different brands, but a, a single company in the background and Interpret focused on uh, GIS and uh, Abley focused on transportation. Uh, now, what we did about three years ago was realize that actually we were much stronger together than we were apart. And so we merged those two companies into one called, uh, called Abley, um, just called Abley, there's, there's, no, there's no afterthought. So uh, we're now just Abley uh, and uh, our speciality is really location technology and transportation. So um, you'll see in a sec that we uh, are pretty focused on location tech, uh, lo location tech, but also we have a lot of experience in that transportation space as well. Head offices in Christchurch. We also have offices in Auckland and then people spread across the country, including Tauranga, Hamilton, Nelson and, uh, and Napier. Now, we actually planned to do this before going into lockdown. Um, so we were, we were, and we still will, we were all hoping to share lunch with you. And uh, um, after this uh, session, um, you'll all receive um, Subway vouchers that when we get out of lockdown, you'll be able to go to, long, to uh, your local Subway and, uh, and, and have uh, lunch on us. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the lockdown, we can't, can't uh, do that currently. Now, a few housekeeping rules. Um, it's important to have these. So basically, it's your house, your rules. Um, toilets are probably in your bathroom, and I'm guessing that's just down the hall. So if you do need to go, make sure you do. Uh, fire alarms, if we have any, they're probably your problem, and um, you're on your own. Sorry, we can't really help from this distance. Uh, dress code, um, I've put a shirt on, but is anybody still in pajamas? Um, hard to tell. Can you please mute, uh, mute your microphones? I think everybody's done that, that's great. Um, turn your video off if you have it running, that's just to help with bandwidth. And um, we will have questions, but if you can save those to the end, that would be, uh, that would be great. So with that, I'll just quickly run through the agenda. So I'm going to start off uh, just talking about the trends of, uh, of what's going on in our industry. Uh, we'll then move on and have Vince. And Vince is one of the few people in New Zealand who's a proper uh, ESRI geospatial, uh, sorry, geodatabase specialist. Um, so he will give you some tips and tricks there. We've got Jeremy talking about uh, enterprise implementation and upgrades. We've got Alex talking about FME. Um, we'll talk, and we've also got uh, Andrew there talking about um, the use of LiDAR and 3D. Uh, Chris, I'm trending Morris. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I've actually got rid of some of that facial hair and less trendy now, unfortunately. Um, I'll just give you a brief run through of, uh, of the spatial side of our company. So we have three teams. We have location solutions um, and all the people there are focused on Esri um, software. We are partners with Eagle. We are partners with Esri. We are certified up to the hilt. Uh, we have uh, Arcturus Online Speciality and we know Portal, Desktop, Enterprise, Web Apps, Security, Database Architecture and so forth. So that location solutions team really focuses in that space. We have a digital engineering team. Uh, we have four certified FME professionals, including a um, FME server certified professional. Uh, and we work mainly there with, uh, with, with, with data transformation, but also with AutoCAD, InfraWorks, BIM, 3D and other tools. Uh, and we have speciality in LiDAR and point clouds, question mark. Not quite sure. Sure, there's a question mark there. We work with point clouds. Um, and then we also have a software development team. So we have 10 um, software developers, uh, all are um, geospatial software developers. That means that they know Esri Tech and they know how to make the most of Esri Tech and be able to build applications, web and mobile, um, using those kind of those GIS skills. Um, and along the bottom, there's just some of the, uh, the clients that we work with at the moment. So I was asked to talk about market trends. So I'm going to run through um, some market trends uh, that uh, are going on in the industry at the moment. Now, we work in a changing market. 
Um, and uh, if you are a little bit older like me, then you know there's Esri and there's Map Info and Indograph. At least there was when uh, I was first got into the industry. Things have changed a little bit, and now Map Info is owned by Pitney Bowes, and uh, Indograph is now owned by Hexagon. Yeah, things are changing. Uh, we're also seeing that what was traditional GIS and what now is location is changing again. And, and we've kind of got this dichotomy in the in the workplace between traditional GIS and this new thing called location analytics. Um, hang on, I'm just in. Oh, there we go. Um, so you are now seeing the likes of Mapbox and Carto and Google Maps, of course, you, you perhaps started the change and here and others all kind of fighting for uh, uh, space in this marketplace. Uh, and that's really meant the location has never been more prevalent and uh, it's never been more in demand. And with the, uh, the current situation, you know, you can see that already. Um, there are so many maps and data sets out there that are focused on using mapping technology to be able to you know, convey a, a convincing story. Um, drones are also important and LiDAR is important and um, point clouds and, and, and all of that new derived data that we're seeing. Um, and uh, part of the reason to talk about this, and Andrew is going to follow up on this uh, more closely. Um, here's an example of a piece of work we've done where we've got, uh, if you can see up in the right hand side, we've got the view from the vehicle driving along the road. And then on the left hand side, we've got that same digital view, that digital twin of that same road. And what we've been doing here is being able to calculate whether you can actually see around this corner, i.e. is it safe to overtake. What we're also seeing is um, amazing 3D data. So uh, I, I don't know quite how well this will come out on screen, um, but we're seeing some really good data, uh, particularly uh, in Auckland, Christchurch and Wellington, this amazing 3D um, data that we, uh, we now have. Others are getting into the market. So who would have thought that Uber, the people that um, used to drive you around, um, have, have got involved in the geospatial space as well. And they've built this product called Kepler, Kepler GL, and it's a fantastic visualization tool. We're also seeing other data sources. So this is uh, data from Downtown AI, and they're using mobile phone information to be able to track and monitor how people move through the city. Um, I'm quickly going to run through some marketing news. There are a whole bunch of different marketing organizations out there, um, and each has a, uh, a different view on the GIS market or the location um, uh, platform market. We're going to start out with uh, this company called Ovum. Um, they're looking at the location platform, and they're basically saying that here, Google Maps, TomTom, and Apple Maps are really leading the way. This tends to be more in the navigation space than kind of uh, analysis, um, but you can see that's, that's a really interesting uh, view on the world and uh, another way of looking at it looking at their reach how far they've reached into the, the kind of the general population and also their completeness in terms of uh, uh, of their platform and here and google are, are clearly out there in the lead um, from the gis market a bunch of research and what you can see here is that the market is growing substantially um, the different estimates but we're seeing you know somewhere between uh, 7.86 billion in 2025 to 19.7 billion in 2025 so there's there's this real growth in the market area there's an interesting uh, view from the uk currently the market there is worth about 2 billion with an expected 12 percent growth it currently employs something like 12,000 full-time equivalents and indirectly a first the 70,000. So you can really see this market um, space has the potential to grow. Um, that's a view of the UK, um, and you can see some of the growth areas there uh, as well. Um, in terms of those growth areas, things like smart cities, urban planning, facilities management, transport and logistics, disaster management, infrastructure, uh, data, both the collection and creation of that data, as well as 3D and 4D, um, GIS, BIM and CAD are all kind of growth areas for the market. Um, and what we can take from that is that local authorities, you guys are particularly involved in these spaces. The trending areas, obviously IoT is really important. Location-based services, so taking geography and serving it as a service to others. Real time is really important. 3D, again, becoming more and more important. And of course, this thing called smart cities, which, uh, which nobody's quite sure what it means, but everybody's particularly excited about. Um, this is the uh, the hype cycle. So the hype cycle really is something that was invented by Gartner. But what it tells you is a little bit about the technology and where it fits on this this thing called the hype cycle. So interesting stuff for us: enterprise GIS, lidar, BIM, location-based services. 
These are all moving from the slope of enlightenment to the product, um, la plateau of productivity. This is when stuff gets really, really useful. Um, over here in the trough of disillusionment, things we're not quite sure about. They had great promise at the peak, peak of expectation, but now we're not too sure. Are things like Internet of Things, smart cities and augmented reality. No doubt these things will come through and grow and become more important for us. So they're worth keeping an eye on. So in summary, um, you may be asking, where's artificial intelligence and machine learning? Interestingly, in the research I've uh, I've read, that hasn't really been mentioned. It's not that it's not important, but I think we're still looking for how important that becomes in the geospatial industry. Um, it's worth knowing you are in the right industry. It's going places. It's uh, it's really exciting to be there at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of future growth in areas where local authorities have a considerable part to play. Um, and uh, you know, to get to start to shape what that future looks like, um, yeah, that's something that local authorities can really get involved with. Um, and it's worth getting there before somebody else does. Although, of course, um, sometimes it's uh, it's better to get a friendly consultant to help you look good. It's my last sales pitch um, there. So look, there's a real interesting space going on in the market. There's lots of things, uh, and it's 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 a great industry uh, to be in. Now I'm going to move on really quickly and I'm going to pass you to uh, to Vince um, and uh, Vince is going to talk to you about um, tips and tricks uh, within the geodatabase. Hi there everyone, um, my name is Vince Poy, I'm the database administrator at Abley. Um, I'm just going to give, just give you some practical um, tips and tricks you can do with your geodatabase. So let's start off um, with attribute indexes. Um, so an index really is useful for when you want to speed up searches. So if it's, a, um, if it's an attribute that you do a lot of searching on, um, such as it, it addresses, um, you can add an index. And there's a lovely screenshot of um, everyone's familiar with ArcMap and ArcCatalog. Um, you can just go to the, to the indexes tab and just go ahead and add an index to that field. Um, and but however, like addresses, addresses can be spread over multiple fields. So you might have the house number, street name, and city, for example. You can actually create an index across those fields. Um, and indexes tend to be most useful and most, most efficient when you add uh, to fields that have very granular data. So that's data that is um, always different. Um, for example, a nice steady increase in dates, for example, would be a, a good index to put a field on. Um, sorry, put an index on the field on. Um, however, a, a field like true or false wouldn't work so well. Um, and please don't put an index on every field because what will then happen is um, it will slow down any editing you might be doing because in the background, the, these indexes are, are continuous, continuously being updated. Next slide is um, coded value domains. So uh, a coded value domain, if you're not already using it, is um, essentially a drop down list that you can add to a field. Um, it keeps your data nice and tidy. Um, so it's unlike free text field where data gets very messy, you can just add a domain to that field. And you can see there in the top graphic, um, it gives you a nice drop down list. That graphic is taken from um, a portal web map. So, so in portal, these drop down lists will, will be present in your data. Um, some of the more advanced users um, might have applications that use SQL directly to your enterprise geodatabase. Um, unfortunately, domains, they, they don't show up anywhere in any database tables, um, unlike things like versions and, and uh, feature classes and, and fields where you can get to those using SQL. Um, domains are not present anywhere. So, so my tip is to build a table uh, and put all of your coded domain values into that table and, and keep it synchronized with your domains that you have in your geodatabase. And that way you can um, use SQL to um, link up all the codes and descriptions. The next tip is relationship classes. Relationship classes are great in, um, again, keeping your data nice and tidy um, and, and just building um, relationships across um, 
feature classes and tables. In this graphic here, we have um, buildings at the bottom. So a building would be um, represented with polygons. Um, and you can have a relationship with the building type. So, um, so yeah, and you can, when you open up these um, relationships in ArcMap, you can flip between the attributes. I've circled the button in red there. Um, so you, we can see we've highlighted two buildings at the bottom. If you click the button, um, that will show you the related um, data that is um, in the related table, the building type. If we take that a step further, we can um, either publish the relationship, the related feature class and table um, to a map or feature service, or you could just simply upload that content to Portal or ArcGIS Online. And we be able to see the relationship in the web or mobile map that you've created. Um, here we've got a graphic of um, ArcGIS Collector. So in Collector, we've got the example here is, um, is uh, a point feature. It looks like a line feature, but it's actually a point feature. And we want to collect um, more leaks with that particular point feature. Um, and it's a one to one to many relationship. So we want to have multiple leaks uh, related to that point. Um, and in the mobile map, in the mobile app, you simply just add a new record and it, it honors that relationship in the database. So you don't need to worry about IDs linking up or anything like that. It just automatically does it. And you don't need to have any fancy configuration or, or any coding, it, it does it all for you. Okay, so let's um, sum up by bringing it all together. So um, again, we can make searches go faster by adding indexes. Um, if you need a drop down list in your mobile map or, uh, or web map, um, use coded domains. You can have relationship classes for those related features um, with with non-spatial tables and automatically you'll see those in your web or mobile map. Now I'm going to move on to um, Jeremy Clark who's going to be talking about upgrading. Good afternoon everyone. So yeah today I want to just quickly speak to you all about, um, uh, sorry Vince can you just allow control for me up at the top? Um, so I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about a bit of upgrading with your ArcGIS Enterprise. So obviously it's something we're all a little bit scared about at times and um, there's <laughs> not something we're all a fan of. So um, it's really important to go through why it's why we need to do this and um, what the benefits you might realize from this. So as I'm sure everyone's kind of familiar, every upgrade with Esri um, should be faster, um, particularly with the latest version 10.7 or the um, the latest 10.1 release, 10.71 uh, release. Um, so at 10.71, they released a whole lot of um, stability improvements at the back end and got rid of a whole lot of architectural changes. Um, and that, using Esri's words here, has really realized some noticeable performance improvements. Um, we recently completed an upgrade for one of our larger clients across, I think a total of 14 ArcGIS servers, four portals, four data stores and something <laughs> something along that. So it was a pretty significant upgrade and the performance improvement we saw was, was pretty good. Um, it also introduces something called shared instances. So um, in older versions of ArcGIS, you're probably all familiar, you have a, a an ArcGIS SOC per service. Um, and that consumes resource on your server and stuff like that. Obviously, 14 ArcGIS servers, our, our infrastructure team was was not super happy about that because it uses a lot of memory and RAM and CPU and so on. Um, so with these new shared instances, what you can actually have is you can have one instance that is shared across multiple services. Um, so those shared instances, when they're not being used, it's much more efficient. It uses less resource on the server, and you can you can minimise your impact on your your um, infrastructure as a result. Um, alongside that, obviously, more speed, more efficiency, more stability. That's all great. Um, the other thing that each version of ArcGIS brings along with it is 
increased security. Um, so 10.7 and beyond, they've started to introduce this TLS by default. Um, so it's at TLS 1.2 by default now. Um, now that means that your communications are much more secure. So older systems, they use things like SSL 3 and, and TLS 1.0. Those, those sort of encryptions are very weak. Um, and if you're using passwords, if you're using security, it's highly easy to break those. So we don't want that. We want to keep your data secure. And I'm sure many of many of the people on this call today, they they want to keep that information they're sharing private. Um, and we don't don't want to have a data breach. Um, the other thing is ArcGIS has introduced some significant improvements with stuff like this that you're seeing on the screen. So um, we worked with a client recently who had an issue in the security report. They found that their, um, their older web applications were able to inject cross-site scripting code into it and, and basically cause the error you're seeing on the screen in front of you. So a user could potentially put a cookie into your map, so puts unsafe code into your map. So the newer versions of ArcGIS have introduced some really great security patches um, around uh, cross-site scripting and, and code injection and things like that. So it's all about making this platform safe, secure, stable, um, and efficient. Um, additionally, support. So it's a really boring thing. We all think, oh, well, we've got a product that should be supported, right? Um, so I actually did a little survey and, and went and found out what your public GIS infrastructure was running on. Um, so Good work to the people who are all on 10.7, great. Um, no one's jumped for 10.8, which came out in, in February, which I'm not super surprised about. Um, but the scary proportion of this graph is these, these people down towards um, the 10.3, 10.4 or earlier range of that graph. So um, what you may or may not realize is Esri's changed their support approach um, starting at version 10.7. So they now have long-term supported releases versus short-term supported releases. And this is the table, this is actually Esri's table on, on the um, right-hand side here. Um, so first things first, 10.4 or earlier, you're no longer supported. Um, so Esri does not provide, it's in that mature support phase. And this table shows it really well. You actually don't get any patches, you don't get any hot fixes. So if something breaks, you can call up Esri and go, hey, it's broken, but beyond that, they're not going to do anything to help you. 10.5 um, obviously has, has extended support out to the end of the year, so you'll still be receiving a few patches, and 10.6 is out to the end of next year. Um, but with this new long-term versus short-term support approach from Esri, um, they've gone for 10.0, so 10.7.0 and 10.8.0. Those releases only get short-term support, so as you can see there, 10.7 um, will actually go out of support by the end of the year. year. So it, it goes into that mature support phase, no patches, no, no hot fixes. So if something breaks, uh, well, you'll probably get told to upgrade anyway. Um, so it's really important to keep up with your upgrades. Otherwise, you are going to get into that situation where something's broken. You're going to call up Eagle or Esri and go, I've got a problem, and they're, they're not going to be very helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, so just keeping, just wanted to highlight, if we look back at that that um, that graph, that there's a large proportion of people, about 20%, who are actually out of support for their public GIS infrastructure. Um, there's a number of people in that 10.5 band who who will be wanting to upgrade fairly soon, and 10.6 and beyond, you've still got a bit of time, but you just want to keep an eye on it. And Esri's recommendation generally is, if you're in general availability, you're good. Extended support, you should probably be thinking about your plan to upgrade, and mature support is not really even something they talk about. So, yeah. Um, the other reason to upgrade is all the new cool stuff that you get. So this is the really exciting bit. So um, Notebook Server is, is something I'm personally very interested in. So Notebook Server is giving you the ability to run Python on top of your ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, and if anyone's actually looked today, you will have found out that it got released to ArcGIS Online last night. So with the um, with the April release or the end of end of March release to ArcGIS Online, they released a ArcGIS Notebook Server beta. Um, so what that allows you to do is do Python on your your portal or your um, ArcGIS Online. Now everyone talks about the data science side of it. Yep, that's really cool. What it also does, and what people probably should keep in mind is the administrative component of that. So Notebook Server, which I believe came in with 10.7, um, 
it also allows you to monitor your content on your enterprise and look for things like data that's um, data links that are broken, maps that use HTTP rather than HTTPS, users who are inactive, all that kind of stuff. So it's actually a really powerful tool for administering your ArcGIS enterprise and sort of extends the capacity that you've already got within enterprise and online. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is ArcGIS Quick Capture and Tracker for ArcGIS. So ArcGIS Quick Capture is kind of similar to ArcGIS Collector, but obviously it's, it's really designed for people who are wanting to get out there and do really quick capturing of content. So driving along a road, I want to log a pothole, I use Quick Capture, tap a button, and it, it um, it's captured. Now, you may have seen a quick demo of that in, in the Eagle session earlier this week. We've used that in exactly that style of scenario for some of our clients. So looking looking at roading and looking at how to how to capture information and, and successfully track where problems are occurring. So it's it's kind of it brings that additional capacity of of fast reactive data capture. Whereas obviously collector, there's a lot more buttons to press. It's a lot less workflow driven. It's it's more about um more about getting polygons and lines and all that, whereas Quick Capture is great for that, just there's a problem at this point. Um, and it was really successful when we used it for that road tracking project. Um, Tracker is a one that's a little bit less developed, but it could also add some value there. So imagine using Quick Capture and Tracker together. I've got my rubbish trucks driving out and I want to log where um, my recycling bins contained rubbish instead of recycling and I want to make sure that I cover all the streets so tracker actually can run in the background and capture routes while someone's using another app such as collector or um or quick capture so it's kind of helpful in that regard um, and could do some good auditing or validation um and the last one and this one is so new that um I couldn't even find a really good logo for it um, it actually only came out in February so ArcGIS mission um I think will be very valuable for the councils here um, so it's a collaborative application for monitoring events. So um, obviously mission, very, very um, American name, I'll call it. Um, it's, it's kind of, so you've got an event like a, a civil defense emergency and you have a mission set up to track and monitor and respond to that emergency. So it's, it's, quite a different ESRI application. I'm, I'm not sure how well it's running at this point because it is so new um, and it's only available with 10.8, um, but it has some really interesting content in there. It's got things called geo messages. So you can communicate between different participants in your mission. So you might have a rivers and drainage dude who's off checking out a drain over in one part of your, your um, catchment, while another guy might be up at the top and they send each other a message saying, this drain's blocked, but this one's not. So where do we need to respond? And you can also mark up on the map and, and, and similar activities. So all those, all those components are really cool things you, that you get by upgrading your ArcGIS enterprise. Um, and I guess, just to wrap up on that, um, obviously, by upgrading your enterprise, you get all this new awesome content. But on top of that, it's actually not as hard as you might think. So I refer back to that upgrade we did for a client, 14 Archer servers, four portals, four data stores, and I've lost count of how many web adapters. It was a lot. Um, that actually was extremely smooth and it was jumping from 10.5 to 10.71 so so a reasonable version upgrade and um yeah it's it seems to be really getting smoother as Esri progresses onwards so yeah um that's all I had to say about upgrading ArcGIS um and now I'm going to pass over to Alex FME man to talk about some of the non-spatial capacity of FME Hi everybody. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about FME today in the context of location not mattering. So um, for those out there who may not know, FME is the feature manipulation by engine by Safe Software, and it's considered as a bit of a Swiss Army knife for your data because it allows you to connect to over 450 different formats and applications and uh, it really allows you to transform your data in a sandbox way and automate a lot of your processes. Um, as you'll all probably know, FME does have its origins in spatial, but now it does an awful lot more. 
Um, so today I want to talk about um, using FME to um, interact with APIs, which are application programming interfaces, and they're used as a communication medium between clients and servers. And they are, allow applications to talk to one another, transmit data and services back and forth for a variety of purposes. Um, they really allow you to add functionality to your applications and integrate for more fluid information delivery. So there are all different types of um, API protocols, but the, probably the one that we're all most familiar with is REST, which is representational state transfer. And um, that's a very commonly used um, protocol within FME API, um, but there are many others which do exist. So um, FME, uh, interacts with APIs in three main ways. The first one is through out-of-the-box uh, transformers such as the Esri Feature Service Reader. Uh, secondly, through web connections, which you can create within FME options. And thirdly, through custom API interactions with the HTTP, HTTP caller. Um, so the first example I want to talk about is using FME to integrate with your CRM. At Ably, we use um, Zero Workflow Max, which is a project management application with CRM elements, and it allows us to manage clients, leads, jobs, and track financials and do some reporting on that. So we wanted to be able to leverage the information captured in Workflow Max within FME, um, but we wanted to do uh, really that in both sides of the street. So we wanted to use Workflow Max data to drive uh, some creation of repositories within FME, but we also wanted to automate our updates to our clients' leads and jobs within Workflow Max using API calls generated through FME. So that's the first example I'm going to just touch on. So that was using um, our Excel source data, um, which we create uh, whenever we create new leads and uh, jobs, we do uh, fee estimates. And so that's using Workflow Max um, uh, using FME to create those um, fee estimates through as new leads in Workflow Max. So that's a spreadsheet that we're all quite familiar with. Um, that, that is the source data for our FME workflow. And the FME workflow goes through, um, it scans Workflow Max um, using a HCTV call and does a whole bunch of stuff, um, unpacking JSON, et cetera, and doing some X query to identify existing clients within Workflow Max because we don't want the FME jobs to be able to create new clients as that would um, allow for a little bit too much power for, uh, outside of the administrative um, users within Workflow Max. So um, that um, essentially creates um, uh, jobs and leads for existing clients. Um, and this is the HTTP caller, um, which uses a get method to retrieve all the existing client uh, information from Workflow Max in JSON format. Um, this, uh, this then, uh, the output created is uh, new jobs and leads within the Workflow Max application itself. So, uh, also, what we like to do within uh, Ably is use FME to actually create and do some automatic housekeeping on FME server. So in our FME development server, we like to automatically create new repositories for jobs and leads that come into Workflow Max, um, especially for those which have particular keywords inside them, such as spatial. Um, so again, um, this workbench does that, um, it essentially goes into the, um, it makes a HTTP call through to the Workflow Max API and retrieves new jobs and leads that have been created within um, a specified time period. Um, it then takes that jobs and leads information and checks the FME server repositories to see if those jobs and leads exist as uh, repositories in the dev server. Um, if they don't, then uh, they are created. Just one nice little tip that I've got for you with this workbench, um, our HTTP caller, uh, we actually repeat the call uh, out through the rejected port. So if there's a, a network issue or you get a timeout error within the um, HTTP call, 
then we use a decelerator to um, put a five second pause on and then to remake that call. Um, that often um, will help with those kind of 401 type errors. Um, and then if we do have a failure on the second attempt, then we will log that and we uh, run that through to a terminator port to end the translation. Um, just one other little tip. Uh, so yeah, and so that's just uh, an FME screenshot of the server showing repositories created by uh, their job codes and with uh, the uh, uh, description information from workflow maps used to populate the descriptor fields in the repository. Um, and then um, just the, the last thing I want to talk about um, is uh, really using FME uh, to help um, automate administrative processes within FME server. So FME server's got a really easy to use GUI, which is um, great for managing content and subscriptions when there's not a huge amount populated within your FME server instances. But as soon as your FME um, growth increases throughout your organization then using the um, GUI can become a little bit cumbersome so um, I created a workbench within FME to be able to allow for batch um, reallocation of uh, resources and permissions within uh, resource categories uh, using FME server so what this workbench relies upon is it uses published parameters to um, be able to select the different types of uh, resources to reallocate. So repositories, topics, subscriptions, publications, and monitoring, all of those are, um, are, are uh, uh, resource categories which can be reallocated. Now we can reallocate um, particular ones by, uh, uh, by specifying them, or we can reallocate all resources within the category and we can reallocate those for particular uh, roles and uh, we can add all or we can specify particular permissions um, to that. So that's a, a really good way to um, do some uh, brute force um, reallocation of uh, resources. Um, so yeah, just a little tip here, we use the FME server email generator with the FME server notifier to um, then uh, uh, inform the people who have had their resources uh, reallocated to them um, so they get an email through to their inbox so that makes uh, things uh, nice and easily communicated. Um, yep so please feel free if you don't use FME already have a go yourself um, Safe Software are offering uh, free licenses during the um, this COVID uh, situation that we've got going on. So for anybody who actually wants to use FME to explore some of the data out there, uh, I'd encourage you to all um, download FME and have a go. Maybe have a, a look at some of the Ministry of Health data and there's a lot of data also available on ArcGIS Online. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, and I'm now handing you over to Andrew to talk about getting the most from your LiDAR data. All righty. I'm going to uh, jump on the back of that good work that uh, Alex has put in and uh, talk a little bit about uh, getting the most from LiDAR in the context of uh, visualising it and using it with uh, FME. Uh, and um, obviously with a short amount of time, I can't go into too much depth, so uh, we might as well just charge straight in here. So uh, obviously the theme of this webinar is uh, location doesn't matter. Um, with respect to LiDAR, I'm just going to talk about sourcing and sorting and filtering and augmenting, doing some extraction and visualization and a little bit at the end on leveraging this for models. Now, OK, location doesn't matter for the various techniques I'm going to be showcasing, um, although it's been a pretty average week in Christchurch, so perhaps we should change our location to somewhere a bit more exciting. So I'm sure uh, you know, many of you might be able to identify where this is. This is actually the Tasman district uh, up at Kaiteri Terry Beach. I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, and I'm sure many of you are also familiar with the Lens Data Service, which provides uh, an excellent platform for sourcing LiDAR derived products. Uh, in this case, I've just grabbed a digital elevation model, which came from aerial LiDAR uh, and some building footprints for this area. So there's also a platform called uh, Open Topography, which lets you download the raw LiDAR um, as it was captured before it goes through any processing. 
And it's really, really straightforward, and it's got lots of uh, LiDAR data sets from uh, all over the planet and lots of good ones from uh, in New Zealand. It's really straightforward to use there. Uh, select an area, check the boxes, submit the job for processing, um, and it will email you a, a download for it. <laughs> now, you can um, get a whole bunch of different derived products in here as well, and you'll see that I've uh, chosen to grab every, every possible classification uh, that there is there, and then I can filter them later on as I need them. So if we take a look at that data that I downloaded from that area, that's what it looks like in, a, in its native uh, point cloud form. That's about 220 million points, and uh, FMEs just uh, theme them uh, automatically by, by elevation there. So now we can take it into uh, FME and filter it down a bit. I like to use the uh, excellent point cloud filter transformer so I can break it down by classification. and uh, this particular transformer I've set up with the ASPRS LAS classification codes. Um, and here you can see everything that's uh, considered a ground return from that LiDAR. And here's everything that's high vegetation, medium vegetation. The stuff's unassigned, although um, this unassigned stuff looks suspiciously like buildings and other hard surfaces. And finally, here's everything that was uh, considered water under the classification. Now, this data all comes pre-classified. However, um, using a number of different tools, you can classify your own aerial or terrestrial LiDAR. Uh, here at Abilene, we normally use the LAS tool suite. All right, so let's look at filtering and augmenting this data a bit more. Um, I like to find aerials from a similar vintage, and if you're lucky, aerials were flown at the same time as the LiDAR uh, data set. So you can then colorize it using a tool like FME. And I've just shown the, the very, very basic workflow here um, down the bottom and, and the effect that you get from it. This only takes a few seconds to run. It's, it's, it's very, very fast. Then you can go ahead and um, extract and, and visualize some of the stuff. So it's normally helpful to have somewhere where you can um, visualize it and you can get the most out of it. Um, I'm using Autodesk's InfraWorks for that, but you could use any um, hardware accelerated spatial platform. Let's go ahead and uh, chuck on a terrain theme real fast. I know that's a bit of a GIS meme, um, but it gives us a better feel for, for what we're looking at. And here's the same data again with your aerials draped in over the top. You might see some odd looking areas on this DM where the buildings are supposed to be, um, some rounded areas on the terrain, that sort of thing. We can fix that. If we go ahead and uh, flatten out the terrain under the building, then you'll see those areas in black have been um, reshaped. And this is basically achieved using some, some straightforward FME transformers and a little bit of statistical analysis uh, to wrap that all together. So here we have the point cloud data we downloaded. We do some similar analysis and we also get the, the building foundation uh, level and the building heights. Um, and we can push it all out into, into a polygon layer and, and just for, for um, visual purposes, I've procedurally generated some buildings in here on top. Um, throughout my model. Let's turn that uh, filtered vegetation back on because it fills out the model really nicely. I'll split this into a number of different uh, files so I can turn them on and off uh, independently in my model. It's a very straightforward uh, workflow and flow and FME to do that. I've also added some uh, polygons there that represent all the water returns that were at uh, sea level. So it adds a nice little bit of ocean there. And I think you can see the tide appears to be out quite a wee way um, based on this. And uh, finally, we should get a feel for how much of the scene is uh, considered vegetation um, and maybe how big each of the vegetation areas are. So using a, a very similar technique to the one I used uh, to get the buildings and the ocean, I've uh, summarized the vegetation data into different groups. Um, and that shows us you know, different, different areas of the vegetation and 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 you know what their their total area is. Now, with respect to you know what you can extract, um, you know it's it's a very powerful tool to be able to extract information from um, from lidar and point clouds with an FME. Um, and your your limit is really only um, the quality of the data and and your imagination and creativity. Uh, and finally, if you want to take the stuff and and move it more and more into the 3D space, then um, you can take it even further. 
There's some great open source tools available for filtering and cleaning and meshing. Um, you can call these from FME with the excellent system caller transformer, and that lets you keep everything integrated in one end-to-end -end workflow. If you use your imagination, I'm sure you can think of some excellent applications for this kind of data, particularly with today's augmented uh, reality and virtual reality technology. So that more or less wraps up um, what I want to talk about in the 3D space. I might throw back to Chris. Hey, thanks, Andrew. If you could, ah, so um, that was a quick run through of uh, some of the different things we're working on, some of the different skill sets we've got. Um, we really appreciate that uh, at this current time, it's a, it's quite a, um, it's quite a strange situation to be in. Um, and what we really wanted to show was that you know we've got skills across uh, across the Esri platform, across FME, uh, you know, visualization and, and and databases as well. Um, we are just about on time, a couple of minutes over. Um, if you have any questions, then we are here and we are happy to answer those questions. Um, if you have other things to do, then that's uh, that's fine as well. But um, we'll be uh, we'll be waiting for your questions if you uh, if you have any. Uh, and uh, our last subway reference, of course, is uh, it's a wrap. So. Um, I really hope you've uh, you've enjoyed uh, listening to our speakers, and I want to say my uh, my thanks to uh, Vince, Jeremy, Alex, uh, and in the uh, in the background uh, Mark and Mel, who've uh, helped pull this together, and um, who've all put the effort in to be able to uh, present this information. Um, so, has anybody got any questions? Just um, if you have, uh, turn your mic off or turn your mic on and just uh, ask away. Okay, no questions, anything? Okay, well, if we don't have any questions. Uh, there's oh. comments coming through, Chris, but there's oh, all saying thank you. Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay, I can't see those, but uh okay well um thank you for your time everyone um if you need to get in touch you uh just reach out to me you know where i am and um i hope everybody stays uh safe and well uh thank you for your time see ya thanks everyone cheers cheers bye Yeah. Can you stop everyone?